Fab. Just wait a few minutes for everybody to join. I can see people starting to filter in now, which is great. Uh, we'll just give all of you a second to get your audio sorted and join. Thanks everybody uh, for coming in and for choosing to spend some of your Friday evening with us. You're safely in a more comfortable place than, than I am, I think. <laughs> it looks like actually, I was gonna say, I thought you've got a lot nicer background there. It's a lot more impressive. Some really amazing historic posters from, um, it was a Hackney Council Listens to Women event hosted by Diane Abbott in the 1980s and then uh, uh, the uh, work with our Black and Ethnic Minorities Forum from that time. So the, the Hackney Archive can give you some really good, powerful um, backdrops. I was going to say, there's some really interesting stuff. Um, right, I think we can get started. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Young Fabians Environment Network event on fighting the climate crisis in local government. I'm delighted to announce that we're joined by Philip Glanville, the Mayor of Hackney, um, just to let you all know, this is our 70th Young Fabians Zoom event that's taken place during lockdown, which is amazing. And um, we're also currently recording for the Young Fabians YouTube channel, which has been launched. And you can see that we're also on Facebook Live. You can share the link that has just been placed in the chat. Um, my name is Laura Cunliffe Hall. I'm Communications Officer for the Young Fabians Environment Network and a member of the Young Fabians. And for a bit of background, the Young Fabians are the under 31s youth section of Britain's oldest left wing think tank, the Fabian Society. We're run by and for young people to facilitate member debate and activism across the UK and engage in policy at all levels to positively influence political decision making. Um, in the Zoom series of events that we've run since lockdown, we've had 30 members of the Shadow Cabinet team. We've had attendances ranging from seven to eight people to around 260. Um, we've obviously launched a YouTube channel and regional groups. And at the moment, the Young Fabians across all our different policy networks are working on nine reports. The Young Fabians Environment Network is working on a report um, around Labour's vision for COP26. Um, so definitely stay tuned um, and make sure you can keep up to date with everything that we're doing on our social channels. You can follow us on Twitter at environmentyf or email us at environmentnetwork at youngfabian.org.uk. Um, just for a bit of background about the Fabian Society, the Fabian Society's foundations are built on defeating poverty and inequality appropriately for tonight's event and um, often through the power of local government and um, to make sure we can deliver for the people that it represents. As the society's founder Sydney Webb once put it, we as socialists much cherish local government. A um, bit of housekeeping now in terms of how tonight's event is going to be structured. We'll start with some introductions. I'm going to ask Philip some questions. And then if you could put all of your questions in the Q and A function at the bottom, I can then get round to those later on in the event and make sure that we can ask all of those to Philip as well. And um, so I think that's pretty much most things in the meantime. And yes, please do check out the Young Fabians YouTube channel um, in the link at the side. Um, you can either ask the question as yourself or you can ask the question anonymously um, so it's sort of up to you really and um, before we get going I'd also just like to say that the Young Fabians do great work to support young activists so you can also um, make sure that you donate to them following links that we'll put in the chat a bit later. Right, without much further ado I'd now like to formally introduce our speaker Philip Glanville who has very kindly given up some of his Friday evening to be here with us. And um, for a short introduction, Philip was elected as Mayor of Hackney in September 2016, becoming the borough's second directly elected mayor. He was re-elected in May 2018. Philip was previously a councillor in Hoxton for 10 years, 
and spent three years as cabinet member for housing before becoming deputy mayor in 2016. In February 2019, Philip as mayor declared a climate emergency in a Hackney Council meeting. At the moment, Hackney Council are taking some of the most robust action in the country in response to the climate crisis. And this includes measures to plant tens of thousands of trees, reclaim our streets from cars and to enable more walking and cycling, tackling poor air quality by reducing emissions from cars, reducing the usage of single use plastics, improving recycling rates and promoting green energy. In March this year, Philip asked the government to ensure that industry plays a role in tackling the climate crisis highlighting that an increased role for councils must be met by an increase in funding for local government to match any new duties that councils are expected to perform. This also relates closely to the Environment Network's theme for the year of holding international governments and corporations to account on the climate crisis ahead of COP26. So Philip, again, thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to start by saying first and foremost, and what you've achieved in your career is really inspiring to a lot of us as young activists. What inspired you to first enter politics and particularly to run for election as mayor of Hackney? So this is actually not a stock answer. It's not a question I get answered very often. Um, and I was just reflecting. So I've been a Fabian since 2006. I joined the Fabians, I think, at their annual conference then because I worked for David Lamming at the time and it was my first experience of a big policy conference like that um, and uh, I was uh, really pleased to be an active member um, ever since then. I stopped being a young Fabian nine years ago um, but I think what you're trying to do across the policy platform is just really exciting and incredible and I think really important to have those space is a safe space is to do policy debate and discussion and the the big issues that we all kind of face i do think need that kind of time and in depth they're not factional they're not easy um they're not necessarily vote winning uh, in the first instance they they need that kind of you know that space to develop and inspire people and i think that's what the fabians um have certainly been doing so my my political journey um to where i am now um i joined the labor party just before going to university I found student politics really toxic. So I had this really burst of excitement. I'm going to university, I'm gonna get really involved, um, but I've never been that interested in kind of, um, you know, who's up, who's down, um, cliques and, and factions. So and I'm not saying all student politics is like that, but um, it, it, didn't, it didn't do it for me. And it took me a while to kind of get that, um, put down those roots in a place in London that you live long enough to actually connect your interest in national politics and kind of social change to place. And I think most of us probably think that the most important thing we might want to do in politics is get elected to Parliament uh, and, and win national government. And although I, you know, I really wanted to um, be involved in like national politics and, uh, you know, but I think when I started knocking on doors in the place I lived, uh, and lived and then you know walked the same streets and got really involved that for me was the sort of connection so I moved to Hackney in 2003 and I um, sort of approached the the local elections in 2006 and thought I, I'd really like to stand I, I've been here three years um, it's a place I want to give back to I, I've seen Parliament actually the connection in Tottenham that David Lammy wanted with the community and the campaigning he did in the community was probably even though he was a minister more interesting to me than the types of stuff that you see going back and forth in, in the comments. So for me, it was that sense of social justice. I, the Hoxton and Shoreditch that I moved to in 2003 is not the place you would recognize now. Uh, it's uh, at the time it was 70% social housing, social housing that had seen none of the investment yet that the Labour government bought through the Decent Homes program. Sure Start hadn't opened. Our schools hadn't been modernised and we were on the edge of Hackney and Hackney was starting to go through that renewal and obviously Shoreditch was a real part of that renewal. But what it was, it, 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 it was ill reconciled to being part of a bigger borough. I used to knock on doors and people were like, ever since Hackney took over Shoreditch, it's been terrible. Um, you know, the factories have closed, the streets aren't as safe, the estates have become more run down, um, there's more inequality. And I think we got elected a team of us in 2006 and we were like, we're going to put Hoxton on the Hackney map. 
it might have been a brand uh, around young British artists, but it, the communities we represented were very, very different than that. And so that, that sort of took us into town hall, took us into campaigning. And just to link to the, the kind of, you know, the social justice element of the of sustainability in the environment. I mean, being sat in a Labour Party meeting and we were thinking about what our three, four, maybe five pledges were for the 2014 local elections. And my colleague, Cal Williams, said air quality. And literally none of us got it. Uh, none of us... Um, thought that that was what we needed to be talking about. Um, it was invisible. Um, yes, we were kind of in favor of sustainable transport and all of those things, but it didn't feel like a visceral thing. And she explained the particulates, the issues around air pollution, the fact that Hoxton had one of the lowest car ownership levels within a borough that has some of the lowest car ownership levels in London, and yet we had the worst air in the borough. And I think we, we took that to heart, we made that a policy objective, and that was before Sadiq getting elected, it was before that Boris had to publish his report about the impact of air pollution on our schools. Uh, and if you think about what's happened since and how salient that issue is and what campaigning issue that is for all parts of the labor movement, but also our local communities. And I think that really galvanized me that um, climate change, air quality, sustainable, uh, livable communities, and the importance of our green public realm, all of those are connected together. Uh, and they're not easy cells necessarily. You know, you, 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 you don't know that you live in polluted air necessarily. Although I did notice in lockdown at the very start, you did notice the difference, absolutely the difference. And perhaps as Londoners, we just couldn't feel it. So I, you know, I'm, I, I, yeah, that's my sort of opening gambit, a big interest in public housing, social justice, and, and recognizing that communities that people think are successful have a lot of complexity underneath them, uh, like Hoxton and Shoreditch do. And you take that to the Hackney perspective, Hackney has had a decade of a booming economy, record business growth, huge amounts of inward uh, investment, but a decade of austerity where we've lost half our funding, a decade of austerity where health inequality, child poverty, haven't just remained with us, but have, have increased despite all of the efforts uh, of, of the council and public servants. So that, that sense of linking these things, with, then, you know, the environment's not nice to do, social justice has to be embedded in it, um, uh, really, really drove me in 2016 and 2018, and we might want to come back to those themes. But that, that's sort of bit of my, uh, a bit of my sort of journey to where I am now. Completely. No, thank you very much. I think that's a sort of really interesting introduction and also shows kind of a real insight into how a lot of the work that you've done as mayor is kind of what, what that was motivated by and where that came from. Um, I think particularly um, a lot of the work that Hackney has been doing around mus municipal energy has been really important and that's one of the sort of key areas where local government can really tackle the climate crisis. Uh, obviously in April 2020, Hackney Council announced that it is now fully powered by renewable energy um, as part of its push to decarbonise the borough. And that managed to sort of take place in spite of all the challenges posed by the coronavirus outbreak. Um, this also followed the installation of large rooftop solar panels on council, council buildings and the recent launch of the Green Homes programme, which will provide um, insulation. And there's also been a lot of renewable heating upgrades for residents. Um, all of these schemes have been delivered, obviously, by the council's publicly owned energy company, Hackney Light and Power, and Hackney Light and Power will support the council in the work to meet declared targets and become a net zero carbon borough by 2040. How do you think uh, other local councils can implement similar models successfully? And what would you say the community response has been like? Uh, huge amount in there, Laura, uh, in terms of, of what you've been talking about. And, um, you know, I, we, were, we developed our manifesto in 2017 and we thought we'd set ambitious targets. And um, we, I think, our, our sort of commitment in our journey as things like Extinction Rebellion and the Climate Emergency um, developed in that sort of first year uh, of the administration where we can go faster. You know, we can be even bolder. So we were saying we would we would um, look to 50% of our energy coming from renewable sources. We decided to go to 100% within one year. So from um, barely a good mix to 50% to 100%, um, as you said, at the start of um, this financial year. Um, we took some inspiration, I think, around our sort of municipal socialism from some of the history of the borough. 
back when we were three separate boroughs, both Shoreditch and Hackney, had this proud, they were poor boroughs. Um, they've never been, you know, Hackney was a bit more middle class kind of uh, in, the, in the mid part of the 20th century and obviously um, was a sort of suburb um, that, that grew. But, but fundamentally, they were quite radical places and they both had their own energy generation. Shoreditch, um, it made it its motto, more light, more power. It was um, literally electricity from dust and rubbish. Um, and that lit some of the poorest streets in London at that time. And Hackney on the River Lee has an, you know, all, uh, the, the turbine halls are sort of still partially there. Um, uh, a power station that, you know, you, you would recognise in the context of a sort of Battersea, a sort of smaller Battersea. Um, and I've, I've always talked about these as sort of pendulums and why I think the, the debate between nationalisation and privatisation shouldn't be something that we're kind of necessarily engaged in. I think it, that municipalization and that community element is really important because it can be a buttress against those big movements. If, if Hackney had retained those energy um, generation, A, it would have been an income for the borough, B, it would have been a social justice issue uh, around how we redistribute uh, energy, poverty and wealth. But also we would be at, we'd be having discussions about how to decarbonize our energy grid and those sorts of things. But that was obviously lost. Um, uh, and that's something that we're sort of returning to. I think there's a huge rich seam of Labour councils across the country doing really interesting things around energy. I don't think Hackney's um, uh, unique in that. I think we're one of the first to move on our procurement because lots of local authorities are locked into a central government led procurement process and no one had really gone to them and said, can we procure joint, jointly green energy? How much more is it going to cost? And then you find out, yes, there is a cost, but it is nowhere near what people uh, first warned us it would be. And if you mix that with energy efficiency, our aim was through the life of the administration to get to the point where we'd actually be saving money, even though we'd gone green. Um, and where we're going to go next with that on our kind of the lights that are powering this building and this laptop is to try and get a direct relationship with a supplier. So we've actually increased the size of the green energy market. So at the moment, we're just buying wholesale green energy from the grid. We want to get a, either a solar array or a, a wind farm direct connection. And we can say that we've helped create that in a community elsewhere. We can't generate all of that locally, um, but we will have that direct relationship. And I think that's a bit of a sort of green industrial revolution post Brexit um, link back into the rest of the country. And so this isn't just a hackney thing. This is a, this is a broader thing. Um, we, we've explored consumer energy and I think we came quite, um, I think it was good that we came quite late to it because we were able to sit, look at what Nottingham had done, Bristol, Islington um, and others. And we were exploring a sort of white label a relationship around our energy company and then selling. But um, Sadiq and uh, London Energy's moved earlier than that. And I think it's a really competitive market and it was always only going to be part of what we were trying to do. So we're focused much more now on generation and thinking about being a sort of energy supplier through maybe EV vehicle points uh, and, and delivering some of those energy sustainability things that, that you've been talking about. So I think it's really important to be flexible and adapt to the political environment, adapt to the challenge that residents place uh, on us uh, and, and, and not, you know, and pivot. Actually, if we ploughed ahead into consumer energy, I think that would have been um, the wrong decision and no disrespect to others. And, you know, Bristol having to adapt and change uh, their municipal energy offer because the market has sort of changed. And I think it's really good people like Octopus and Bulb have disrupted that market because when people uh, like Notting, uh, uh, Robin Hood Energy first entered the market, there weren't those disruptors. Mm -hmm. And one thing I do think the campaigners have done is ensured that now both Octopus and Bulb aren't just looking for... Um, the kind of middle class energy switches they're talking about prepayment meters and uh inequality around the energy market and i've been working locally with hackney citizens and local churches to um, show that you can switch uh, to green energy and save money and that is a really fundamental thing to us that that social justice link as a consumer can be can be made and this isn't just a nice to do that other people um do on on um Generation, we, we hope, COVID permitting, to uh, continue our journey to installing more PVs, uh, solar panels on our roofs. That's not quite achieved what you described, Laura, because we've just had some of that disruption yet. 
but it is our, definitely our aim to make use of all of our municipal rooftops, uh, places like leisure centres and housing. And the other thing is there's a lot of energy infrastructure that we own already. So we have communal energy systems, a lot of uh, regeneration schemes that have energy systems. And the model for that, if any of you, I'm sure there are young Fabians that live in new builds, you are locked into a heat contract um, that has very little transparency, no ability to switch, often not using green energy. And, and that profit is leaving not only that development and that community, but just going completely elsewhere to the big six. We've, we've got a real clear plan to own our own energy infrastructure. Uh, and while obviously it's gas fired on most municipal and decentralized energy at the moment, owning that and being able to switch it when the right technology comes forward is really important to us, but also basically charging at cost, small community dividends, but somewhere like Woodbury Down will be a community owned Hackney Council and community owned energy system powering five and a half thousand homes when it's complete. That could have been lost to the community. That could have been something that just sucked money and wealth away. We want to use it to put money back into community projects and also green infrastructure. So I hope that gives a sense of what we think the power of um, green and municipal energy can do for a community. Completely. And I think particularly the point you made about social justice sort of being at the heart of all the decisions that are taken. I think um, that's sort of particularly important and it's kind of reflected in the work that you can see the council's been doing. Um, you sort of mentioned funding there. Obviously, um, that's a massive issue at the moment facing local councils across the country. There were already huge funding pressures in place, which obviously threatens council's abilities to deliver frontline services. This um, is probably going to become even more stretched due to the likely economic recession resulting from COVID-19. Um, in PMQs this week, Keir Starmer sort of mentioned the support that local government needs and basically stood up for local government and said to the Prime Minister, look, you know, local councils have done everything that's been asked of them during this crisis. When will the Prime Minister take some responsibility and do something to help them? And um, so the underfunding of core services is obviously a huge concern. As young activists, how can we convince our councils that green budgets are the ones that should be protected and not cut? Well, the, the figures that Keir and, and, and Boris debated are really stark. And, you know, the, the Hackney figure is £71 million gap in one year. To place that in context, the entire cuts of our central government funding over a decade of austerity were 140 million. And obviously that's had a huge impact on council services and what we've been able to do and focus on. So there is absolutely no way local government in one year can deal with uh, uh, and try and recover from in one year a financial position. And for people on the call, local government's kind of unique within the public sector. Every year it has to have a balanced budget. So unless there is a way of effectively spreading that cost over a longer period of time or getting that government funding in, really, really hard and difficult decisions will be taking place all across the country. What I would say is that this, these decisions are not nice to do. So this isn't a choice between climate change and adult social care or climate change and children's centres. The, the heart of the social justice point is the energy market was broken and it was delivering fuel poverty and it was delivering cold homes. Uh, air pollution has the biggest impact on those that don't have, own cars and don't make that pollution both in this country and abroad. That has long-term health consequences. Um, if you don't have sustainable, affordable um, transport, it has a knock-on effect on jobs and opportunity. So um, I don't think you can, you cannot look at a, a council budget and spreadsheet and say this, this sits over here, we can't do it. Um, there are also sources of funding though. There are sources of funding within our planning system. So any building, any development that doesn't deliver the carbon targets that are required for it has to contribute to a carbon offset fund at a local level. Um, and so we've been thinking about how do we use that? How do we match that with other grant programs? And that's gone into our energy company and done some of the work to do energy efficiency. Um, project. And, and the main problem with all the government funds is the people they ignore are social tenants and private renters. 
And I would imagine of, of the people watching this, most of us are social tenants or private renters. You know, young Fabians are under 31, wherever they are in the country, they're very unlikely to be um, uh, homeowners. And uh, the types of long-term decisions that you can make as a homeowner to green your home, put solar panels on the roof, get that payback, landlords won't do it private renters won't necessarily stay long enough to do it and they're living in the, the, the moat. So we've, I think, you know, very clear to government that, and the Labour Party that any, any Green New Deal around creating jobs, making our homes more energy efficient, has to speak to the, the, the renter. 80% of Hackney residents are renters. And we've been trying to fill that, that, that gap. And I just, I just think on all of this, um, so our tree programme, our tree programme and green infrastructure that has continued to roll out during... Um, coronavirus has created, um, uh, we're, we're committed to planting, and I have to say this number goes up all the time. Um, we were originally planting a thousand trees over four years. We're now planting at least 35,000 trees in the next three years. That's the scale of our ambition. But what we found is, whether it's trees for cities, whether it's others, there is a lot of people that want to help partner with local authorities, businesses, voluntary sector organisations to plant trees. So by, by showing that leadership, by saying, let's work together, let's plot out where those trees can be, we uh, working with developers even and saying trees and in green infrastructure have to be a part of your development. It doesn't have to be that kind of conversation between children's centres and green infrastructure and, and making sure that our streets are better for cyclists and pedestrians and public transport. So, you know, our SUDS programme, so sustainable urban drainage, there are pocket parks being created all across this borough as we sit here. Um, the tree planting has continued. The filtering, um, expanding our school streets, uh, all of that is something you can do um, at, even within the context of really tough financial um, uh, climate. And I think it is about putting pressure on local authorities, challenging, looking at best practice, and then adapting it for local communities. Um, don't forget, most of the things I'm talking about did start bottom up, and they probably did start from outside of the council. Mm. You know, people that wanted parklets were saying, why, why, if I don't own a car, is the only way to use public space? A discussion around car parking. Yeah. Why can't we see that repurposed for pocket parks, parklets, um, filtering schemes, building out pavements and planting trees? Why can't we change our urban environment uh, and that debate? So I just encourage everyone to look at there's amazing good practice out there across Labour and local government uh, and, and what it, there's a competition. You can see that on Twitter. Uh, follow Councillor John Burke, follow uh, uh, Claire in Lambeth, follow Clyde Lopes in Waltham Forest, and we're out there trying to really lead and show um, with our communities what you can deliver. Definitely, I think that'll be a one I have to check out for sure. Um, I think obviously a lot of what you mentioned at the moment, um, parks and green spaces are a massive lifeline to people, um, and access is more important than possibly ever has been, particularly people's physical and mental health. Um, you mentioned uh, all of the tree planting going on in Hackney, which I think really helps to towards this idea of public realm improvements. Uh, how can other councils and local government organisations continue to ensure that our green spaces are protected in this way? And how can they also help increase biodiversity and um, particularly in urban spaces like London, encourage more rewilding of some urban spaces? I think, it, I think it's a part of this is sort of the permission to experiment and, and innovate. If you yeah. told me two or three years ago that we would basically rewild one of the wards in Hackney, which is Kings Park, with Friends of the Earth and the local community, um, I would have been quite... You know, what I, what, the expectations around what the public realm is supposed to look like. So a perfectly mowed grass verge was the aim of most of local government up until very recently. And if it looked a bit messy, the council had somehow failed. So um, the shift has been, you know, the, the tree pit is my classic example. A really badly planted tree is a tree that basically has some sort of membrane right up to its stem. And there's no opportunity for biodiversity around the bottom of it. We've all seen it. I've been responsible for delivering it. 
Um, the next best thing is some drainage. Then you can have some ornamental planting around it, or you can actually use it as an opportunity to create biodiversity and rewilding. And actually the rewilding and biodiversity done in the right way costs less maintenance than any of those other options. And I think that's the other thing, you know, mowing less costs less. Um, I, you know, there are some amazing ornamental flower beds in the borough and we're not going to be taking them out in our parks and they're, they're beautiful. That isn't the only answer to making a park um, fantastic. And the, some of the sustainable urban drainage that we've put in place with the, the bushes and the planting and the biodiversity and thinking about climate change and different species of tree and how they complement each other and how they flower at different points in the year of all how this can be delivered with a bit of experimentation and stopping using, reducing our use of glyphosate, um, changing how we maintain our town centres um, it, it's transformative and if I, I haven't been down to Kings Park um, uh, this spring but you turn every corner and you'd see the flowering of poppies and flowers and seeing every single space that was previously grey, green uh, or delivering absolute beauty uh, and, and I think that doesn't cost more um, but I remember being a new councillor and we, we were having a discussion around um, some food growing. The anger from local residents about the idea of delivering a community allotment rather than a green lawn, because people were like, it will deliver pests, no one will maintain it. We've been here before, who's going to get access to it? What happens if they then don't use their box? like huge like debate but actually it brings communities together in ways that a piece of beautifully mown grass cannot so i think you know getting stuck into those micro projects and seeing what is possible um really delivers that biodiversity and re and, and and rewilding that's so important and i think you know regeneration is challenging planning and development and growth is challenging and i think what we've tried to deliver on that sort of agenda now is again not the sales brochure kind of realm that you get around that so make it inclusive yeah. um, make it available to uh, everyone put play at its heart and then think about food growing think about that biodiversity and and just evolving that and constantly innovating it so written into our local plan is inclusive play it's more uh, it's an upgrade in the green infrastructure it's swift boxes uh, it's all of that as well as the green energy and and there's so much possible without costing kind of the public purse more money um it's about the policies that you wrap around all of it and the challenge that people bring so i've been part of the fundraiser to keep the postcode gardener going that delivers that amazing realm uh with friends of the earth in uh, king's park uh other any ward in london could club together raise funds for community gardener, have a conversation with a local council about what spaces they could rewild uh, and then get cracking. Um, it does need some infrastructure around that. We had a, an amazing organisation called Dorbney Fields Forever. We had a tenant managed estate that was already interested in food growing. So, you know, there were, there were some things that you anchored that into. Yeah. Um, but then the schools want to be involved and then they want a school street and then you get to know your neighbour and then you want the road closed because you want your kids to play outside. So it has a lot more than just a green agenda, an explicit green agenda. It's about community and livable neighbourhood agenda beyond that. Completely. And I also sort of really like the idea of um, what gives a community its character and bring it together sort of doesn't have to be, as you say, the perfect green lawn. Um, the, alterna the alternative is a school that has a gridlock around pick up and drop off, yeah. endless microaggression. Yeah. You only get angry when you see the, your, you know, somebody dropping a kid off at school, or you can have a street that encourages that moment of conversation, encourages kids to play while um, you know, parents or carers are, are chatting in safety. Um, and we've got a bit of a vision around that. So it's into around 21st century streets. What would a perfect street look like as an exemplar and what would a 21st century estate look like and that is you know a school street a play street a park lot, um the the greening good ev charging infrastructure and as reducing as much of the food traffic as possible and i think we're doing that in dalston colverston crescent and right at the end of it will be a municipal water fountain and then looking for our first estate where we can do the same. And I think that also shows what that environment can look like. And 
to be honest, most people, when they see it, they then want it themselves. Yeah. And, and that, again, comes back, back to that competition between local authorities and communities, a really healthy competition around yeah. innovation and what can be delivered. Completely. Um, so if you mentioned about um, providing the correct green infrastructure, um, obviously at the moment the street space scheme that Transport for London have been doing um, has sort of seen a lot of changes um, to streets and roads across the capital um, with pavements widened and more space for pedestrians and cyclists. How can local authorities sort of effectively ensure that types of schemes can potentially be rolled out more widely across the country but particularly in rural areas where people are sort of already more likely to use cars and there can be potentially more narrow roads and that sort of thing? Well, I, th I think the, the focus always has to be on those, those journeys that are kind of under three miles. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, it may not work for a truly rural area, but a lot of suburbs uh, and small towns have a lot of people doing journeys that, uh, in, in London and in other urban environments would be done on foot or by public yeah. transport or by yeah. um, cycle. And I think um, there's some really good work by Labour Cycles um, around the levels of um, spending that goes into sustainable transport um, and resetting that. You know, there's a lot of money for your 400 million pound bypass, but there's not um, uh, money for communities to really rethink how their, their roads work and how you bring that sort of safety to um, that, that kind of local uh, environment. And I don't think, you know, ha interestingly, all of the studies internationally and in, you know, Amsterdam and Copenhagen was car dominated in the 1970s yeah. as, as London was before we started this journey. It, it was not a natural state, those, those, those places that we look for as exemplars of sustainable transport. They started to make decisions and, and, and change their urban environment. And they actually have probably at far higher levels still of car ownership than actually um, some of the urban areas of the UK. So we've got some things going for us actually in terms of um, that switch. And, and Hackney, it did some very early filtering in the, in the 80s and 90s in the Beauvoir and other places. Um, but, and, and even in Waltham Forest, you know, you could see sort of the seeds of what people were trying to do. And then it didn't get sustained and continued in the way um, that, that it is now. So I think there is, there is always something that you can do uh, and look at. And it isn't one size fits all. I remember debating school streets and, and saying not every community will it, will it work. But I, I think a lot of communities it will work. Um, uh, in, in going forward. Definitely. Um, I think I um, want to bring in some questions soon because I can see the Q&A tab is filling up with some really interesting questions. And um, you can also upvote um, a question you particularly want to ask. So um, I encourage you to do that. Um, before we get into the round of questions, I want to quickly bring up the idea of the green recovery, which obviously is a concept that's um, talked about everywhere at the moment. Um, how can national and local government most effectively redeploy workers to shovel ready green infrastructure projects, particularly like renewable construction, nature conservation and home insulation? And off the back of that in particular, how can central government support local authorities to help stimulate the growth of the green economy to ensure that we can all work towards this idea of building back better? Well, I suppose it has to, for me, start from a really honest position that it isn't about an economy that's constructed in the same way that it is now. Yeah. Um, and I come back to the school run turning that from a diesel and petrol dominated car based school run into an EV Land Rover dominated school run. I picked Land Rover as a great British brand, um, people that are obviously wanting to make the switch to EV vehicles, but that is not a positive, that is a, a, that is a, 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 a it should be a cul-de-sac for us. If there is a Land Rover, yes, it should be an EV one, but it shouldn't be doing the school run in an urban environment. And so I think both going into the last election on the, on the Labour side, we were saying that you can have the same type of 
society and the same levels of so, uh, economic growth, but you don't have to tackle some of those big decisions around car dominance, ownership, um, uh, flying, um, uh, how we use plastics, uh, the throwaway society that many of us um, have come from. Uh, you, you can't go on like that and just make those sort of green changes on that journey. You know, you can make a, a, a water bottle that is 100% biodegradable, but the carbon impact of still transporting that water around and consuming it versus having a network of municipal water fountains is, is so different uh, in terms of sustainability and cost as well. You know, the water that we provide will be free. This is a, 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 a pay thing. So I think in terms of a, a, a green economy, we need to make sure that we, we are, yes, where there is no alternative, we're looking for the very green, greenest solution, but also thinking about other forms uh, of investment. And I actually think, come back to the bypass, you know, four, 400 million pounds on one bypass, and I know that's a straw, you know, bypass, it doesn't exist anywhere, but that's the type of money that's often banded around in big national infrastructure projects, or fund 400 million pounds invested in local communities to make those small incremental changes that make areas more livable, more sustainable and more beautiful and could deliver local jobs in those communities, local apprenticeships. And my, my sort of municipal socialism is, is really driven as well by insourcing. Mm. And uh, a lot of the expertise that delivers the programs that I've been talking about, not all of them, um, but is having you know, an insourced park service that has people that can lead on biodiversity, that are arboriculturalists that understand trees and how they should be planted and what types of trees uh, you should um, buy. And I think that is also part of this. You know, we insourced our fleet of vehicles and, um, and that allowed us to think about how we green that fleet. So the aim by 2022 is to have a carbon neutral fleet and work uh, on things like our bin trucks where there isn't actually a fully um, at tailpipe um, uh, solution yet available at a cost we can afford. But we can get that as green as we can by being a purchaser and an investor and saying that that's the type of fleet we want uh, in the next few years. And we've made tremendous strides in um, or, you know, making sure that our housing service and all of those people are using the green. So if that is all outsourced, and you're negotiating within multiple contracts about trying to get that shift um, in, in, in vehicles. And again, um, I think that's about creating greener jobs uh, and sustainable jobs and jobs in, in our local communities. And I think we've done some really good work with local business through our Zero Emissions Network, which is a partnership between uh, the Mayor of London, Islington, to Hamlets and the City about supporting small SMEs to make those switches. So it started City Fringe and it was about um, cycling infrastructure, uh, um, enabling people to try out different types of EV vehicle, cargo bikes, EV vans, learning from peer. So if a florist has already made the switch to the EV van and the cargo bike, they can talk to another florist or food delivery company to make that switch. And we can look at what grants are available and what loans and support to make those. And we've now basically rolled that out across the borough. And again, it's sort of, for me, it's about um, a social justice issue and a just transition for business as well. You know, if we're going to see the ULES come across Hackney, which we really want for air pollution, let's get in and talk to those businesses that are reliant on that delivery economy first and try and get as much of that upfront investment. So I'm not sat, sat in a public meeting um, with 100 businesses in State Newington going, uh, we now can't get deliveries, we now can't do what we need to do because we've been having that conversation earlier. So yeah. I think it's about honesty, um, that it can't stay the same. Um, and, and if we're to make this change, we, we, we have to deliver it that still delivers the, the, the eco economic. What I don't have a, a clear sense of as a local government leader is how, and I think we've been talking about it for a long, long time and never really seen it sort of materialise where you sort of suddenly see a million green jobs from Whitehall across a, a, you know, I think it's going to be much more localized than that and you know creating the expertise to install solar panels on, in a solar co-op on an estate um, creating those, those 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 skills at a local level um, rather than that sort of 
you know, big sense in five years time, we can just have a million jobs out of, you know, I'm sure I heard Tony Blair talk about that. I'm sure I heard Gordon Brown talk about that. I'm sure I heard David Cameron talk about that. And it kind of does get lost. So I think that, that focusing on the local and what you can deliver uh, and delivering real apprenticeships and, and, and opportunities is probably be, be the, the better route to go down and then aggregating that back up. Yeah, no, I completely agree that sort of um, the focus on the local and the practical level really is um, sort of definitely the best way to kind of kick things off. Um, so we're going to open up to some of the questions we've got uh, in the Q&A. Um, at the top, we've got a question from Amy Hall. She's asked, uh, as someone hoping to stand as a county council candidate, what initial steps can you take to help the council prioritise practical climate action, both in the campaigning stages and then hopefully if elected? Well, I don't know the county, I don't know the context, but absolutely do it, do stand. Um, I do think, you know, Labour is largely in opposition across our counties at the moment. I think there's county elections next year. Um, on all, I, I think all sorts of areas, whether it's climate emergency, modern slavery, food poverty and food justice, um, small groups of co-op and labour councillors have delivered a huge amount of change. You know, going to County Hall, uh, asking for an ambitious count, uh, climate change motion, collecting the signatures, um, linking with civil society groups and even where we're not in the majority, making sure that those local authorities pass those sorts of motions and then get held to account for it. And then if you're elected using scrutiny, hopefully I, I hope you uh, stand, win and become the administration. But actually on this agenda, there's a huge amount that can be achieved. You know, why isn't there a, a, you know, a, a scrutiny committee with a climate change remit? And if we're talking about the sort of micro and community stuff, thinking about food growing, thinking about how a street can change. Is there a school street campaign to be had with a local primary school? Um, those sorts of things. Is there adequate bike parking? Fundamentally, one of the biggest obstacles to anyone cycling is getting to the end of the journey and finding nowhere to park the bike, getting really annoyed, being late for a meeting, losing that bike if it gets nicked. And you can still cycle to most of our, you know, cycle to Whitehall for a meeting with government and see if there's anywhere to park your bike is is a just a sort of so those sorts of things and i think nottingham has shown the way with i'm, I'm sure the financial challenges right now but the workplace parking levy reinvested in public and sustainable transport so there's the, the money hasn't been taken you know it's not a tax that's going somewhere else it's going back into the residents and businesses within the city to deliver the changes that mean you don't have to drive to that 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 job and i think in a local community, there is definitely the ability to do all of that and think about, but pick one or two issues, make it your own, um, and you'll be surprised how many allies there are out there. And I think there is a sort of, you know, I did a big public meeting hustings where people were really angry about controlled parking. And I said in that meeting, I'm not anti-car, I'm pro-people. I don't believe the world will end if we introduce controlled parking. And the communities where that has been introduced, people come up to me now and say, there's less people driving around the block trying to find a parking space if you still need a car. I've been able to park outside my house or drop my kids off while I then go and look for parking space in a way that I never could before. So even those with large families, um, people with their disability or people that just need it for work, do sometimes, you know, they get angry and think, why should I pay for a parking space? I should just have a right to park on the road. Actually, when they see all that community parking disappear, yeah. it, it leads to a better environment. So I think it's just being honest with people. No, completely. I think um, that sort of point of honesty is um, a really important point for sure. Um, the question we've got next is from the uh, Environment Network's Policy Officer, Holly Smith. Um, she's asked about urban biodiversity um, at the Environmental Audit Committee this week. Barry Gardner, Press for Minister, um, on, uh, where's the question gone, sorry. On a lack of local authority planning capacity and expertise on biodiversity. And so therefore, how can boroughs work together and with Metro mayors to share expertise so those with less capacity can still maximize biodiversity on housing estates? Well, I think there, um, there were really good stats that I don't have 
to, to hand, but are sort of easy to discover about the, you know, with the cuts, the decimation of kind of expertise in local authority planning um, at departments and that sense that, you know, developers have a huge advantage when it comes to an, an agenda like this. I think in London, we probably do have some advantages. We have a London local plan that has um, a lot of good um, sustainability policies in and local plans like Hackney's that have sort of embedded them. Um, I do think you, you know, the, you, you can put some of the costs of this onto development. So if you get the right policy in place and a developer knows it has to meet um, green infrastructure and biodiversity targets, and then you effectively charge the planning system to monitor them, then you get your your expertise in house or in collaboration with other local authorities. And you can, you know, uh, it's the same with heritage officers. You know, if you commit to it, they sort of end up over time paying for themselves. So I think being ambitious, I think I was asked a very similar question to this at the in Environment Committee. Um, I do think there's a role for the LGA and the government to support and making sure that there is that policy expertise. I know that the Local Government Association has created a network uh, within the Labour Party side of local government to look at the climate emergency and what practical examples are happening across the country to respond. There's a really good micro site that they set up and, and just that peer to peer support for councillors um, uh, and activists across the country to, to, to deliver this. Um, but there is, you know, probably, you know, we will get to a point where we, we, we run out of tree experts and agriculturalists if we have to deliver on this agenda. And we, we have to make sure that, that the investment is going upstream in getting people to enter. You know, I think the um, public practice that the, the, the um, it was set up as a social enterprise at City Hall to get more people interested in municipal planning and architecture and urban design and placing people in local authorities so that people are inspired to be part of this agenda and come yeah. into um, this industry is really important. Um, Metro mayors though are, are leading, you know, if you look at the, the, the work that's happening in, in Manchester around cycling and sustainable transport, um, really good work happening at, at Birmingham Council around the same. And, you know, Birmingham is the most car dominated city that you come up with. Yeah. And their, their cabinet member there is really leading um, from the front and, uh, and, and I think all of us that you know from Tom Watson to myself um, to Waco in Birmingham you know we've all lost weight because we've moved on to cycling and living the more sustainable lifestyle and, and it, it becomes quite an you know infectious thing to talk about is that those small life changes can have an, a personal impact as well. I think estates are tricky you know looking at if you look at it from a kind of risky maintenance perspective around trees and green infrastructure, I think housing associations and landlords get quite nervous. Um, I don't think it has to be as negative a, a discussion as that. And again, it's thinking about, well, if the capital costs can be met, can the revenue costs then be met um, by, by, by landlords? But also is the ways of saying, well, we're going to mow less, we're going to have planting that maintains itself we're, we're not going to constantly, you know, we're going to plant the right tree in the right place. We're not having to constantly come back and pollard. I think there's a lot there that we need to work with landlords um, across the piece to try and, uh, and explain. Um, uh, I probably haven't really answered the question. So, yeah, the challenge exists, but I do think there are some answers out there. Uh, and we just got, I do think the peer to peer support is really important. Completely, yeah. I think that's. Um... A really interesting question. There's also um, another question that um, is quite uh, poses some food for thought from Tom Hayes, which uh, asks if uh, you had the resources slash time slash uh, anything you needed to introduce one new council led change to meet the climate emergency and advance social justice. That is something you're not already currently doing and planning to do. Uh, what would that be? That is a terrible question. That is a really <laughs> hard question at seven uh, seven twenty six. Tom, be more like <laughs> be more like Tom and what they're doing in Oxford. You know, a, a city in a sea of blue that has a really radical sustainable transport plan that it's convinced the county council to kind of broadly come alongside with. And I know the work that Tom has done there because I've appeared on um, at similar uh, events. I do think something. Um, uh, I think the, 
the, the Nottingham and Oxford example around the workplace parking is not so relevant in Hackney because we don't have businesses where we've got large car parking, but that is a source of income that can be put into sustainable transport. Um, I, I, I think we're doing it. I don't have an easy answer. I think we're doing everything. I would supercharge what we are, what we're doing. Um, I do think there's something about energy that we are now moving away from gas led community energy. It's not going to conform to London plan. It's not going to conform to our climate change targets. Some of the innovation around air source and ground source heat pumps and kind of electric um, energy at the moment um, are really expensive. Um, they're really complicated for the end user. And I don't think we have the skill sets within our landlord functions to maintain them. And I think we need to really work together on what is a solution that meets those environmental objectives, can heat our homes, can be rolled out at reasonable cost. It feels like the sort of energy that went into that the clockwork radio um, that Trevor Bayliss designed, which was a very easy, low tech, sustainable solution to a problem. Uh, all of the stuff that I've seen is very complicated, has no proven track record. Where we've used stuff, we've had to replace it very quickly. So I think how we heat our individual homes at a cost that isn't felt by the end tenant, and a lot of developers will put in very clever green systems and then obviously walk away. And, and I've seen that as social landlords as well. So my number one thing that would advance social justice is, is really coming together as, a, as an industry as local government and government and say, what are we going to do about this? This could create real jobs and innovation in Britain if we get this right. And it's beyond uh, one single part of the system solving itself. And also why we haven't brought our climate target down to 2030 or 2025. Yeah. Because someone can explain to me how 30,000 individual gas boilers in Hackney are going to be replaced uh, at that sort of time scale. Um, in a way that won't plunge people into fuel poverty, um, I, I'm, I'm sceptical about hitting those, those targets. That doesn't mean you don't push. And, you know, obviously, on all the things I've been talking about, we're pushing. But you also don't want to let down a generation that's campaigned for something by saying we're going to be carbon neutral by a date we're not. And that comes to the sort of green activist uh, how you involve XR, how you involve kind of climate change kids groups, how you involve CIRA, the broader yeah. Fabian network. All of these people have a role. Citizens' assemblies are really important. Um, Adam, who's managing this event, and I sat with kids in Town Hall Square uh, talking to them about their ambitions on this agenda. Um, but you've got to be able to look them in the eye and say you're actually going to do it. Yeah. Uh, it's not you sign a document and then leave it to the person after you to deliver it. We really have to have stuff that's deliverable. And I think uh, the idea of direct action is sort of really important. And as you say, is sort of something people want to see and expect to see. Um, so I think we can start to round off from there. That was a really interesting set of questions. Um, if uh, anybody would like to send any questions that have been unanswered to the Environment Network email, and um, we can send those across to Philip and make sure we can get that. I'll just say to Melissa, who's asked a question, just get, get involved in any part of the structure, whether it's Lead Party, Young Fabian, CIRA, your local XR group, um, uh, Friends of the Earth, whatever it might be. Um, there, there are really good groups out there, I think, wherever you are. Um, you know, sus, sustain, sus, uh, most boroughs have sustainable groups. Um, you've got London Cycling Campaign and their local branches. You've got Living Streets, um, Sustrans, really inspiring organisations with local, that are hungry for local people that know their communities better than them. Yeah. Because if you, you can have all of these national campaign or regional campaign organisations or even borough campaign organisations, but if you don't have someone living on that street that says, do you know what, that junction's just got to change. Yeah. That's what I would say to that, that sorry to cut across. but I No, just, completely I agree. I think um, sort of getting involved as much as you can, um, sort of that, Every level is really important. Uh, if there's any changes you want to see, um, got to try and sort of get involved and do as much as you can to make those happen. So, no, I completely think that's um, a really nice point to draw it to a close as well. Um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Philip for joining us tonight and providing us with so much insight, not only about the work that Hackney Council are doing, 
but about the work that is sort of going on up and down the country to ensure that local government can tackle the climate crisis. Um, before we go, a uh, quick plug for some Young Fabian's Environment Network activity we've got coming up. We've got an event on Tuesday, um, which is discussing environmental policy to contribute to the Labour National Policy Forum Consultation 2020. And um, sort of that carries on the theme of sort of getting involved and making your voice heard. So really encourage you to go along to that. Um, on Monday 29th of June, our policy officer, Holly, has got a really fantastic event she's hosting on decolonizing environmentalism and the need for more intersectionality across the climate movement, which is um, incredibly important. And I'd really encourage you all to go along to that. It's one not to be missed. And um, then again, if you can make sure you check out our social channels, um, if you want to get involved with any of the work that the Young Fabians is doing, you can also email info at youngfabians.org. Um, and basically, again, thank you, Philip, so much for your time. Everybody for coming for your questions that's um, instigated some really interesting discussion and for spending some of your Friday evening with us and hope that you all have a lovely weekend. Thanks very much. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.